So uh, today's topic is creating user-defined functions. So we, um, and we actually have done this already, but we'll be talking about it more specifically today. Uh, but of course there are functions that are built into and part of Excel. Like what's, what's a function that you might use in Excel? So yeah, so that'd be a VBA function, a function built into VBA, len. Uh, I think it's actually the same name in, uh, as a cell, like you can use a function in a cell. But the one that you came up with, the one in my mind, which was sum, like the sum function. And there's, what else do you have? You've got like the payment function, the present value function, the sum if function, count function, all functions. Well, it turns out that um, we can write our own functions to be used in Excel. And of course, anything that we write, any function that we write in VBA can also be used in VBA. And so that, that's the idea today is creating a function that we can either, and, and by a function, I just mean it's a block of code that I'm gonna send a value to and it's gonna send a value back. Um, in fact, you don't even have to send a value to a function. Like some functions you don't send values to, there's not many of them, but there's a few like, like the rand, like the rand function. I don't think there's an argument you send to rand because it just gives you a random number between one and zero, some number of decimal places, uh, like the now or the date. It just reads the date from the system clock. So you don't give it input, it gets its input from somewhere else. Uh, okay, and so we have a workbook to uh, download ISBN 2 to XLSX. And that's gonna be our, that's going to be our chore for today. So our what we're going to do, in fact, it has to do with, well, let's tell a story. Let's start off on that sheet. In fact, I'm just going to come here and I'm going to make a blank sheet. And you don't need to do this with me. Let's just kind of sit back and watch and let's just have a little discussion here at the beginning. So I'm going to start this off by making all of my cells have a background of black. Ooh. And then let's make the, the font color kind of light green on all of these cells. Zoom in a bit. Does it look like we're in the 1970s yet? Control plus, I don't know. How do I zoom in? Oh, down here. Okay, and then the, so one last thing we have to do to really feel like we're in the 70s is have a, 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 a monospaced font. So let's choose, um, what's the one, Times New, no, no, what's it called? It starts with a C, Courier. Okay, so there's a, there's a, can I type it? C O U R. yeah. Courier, oh, it's already highlighted. Okay, good. And bold. Okay, that kind of looks like a terminal, something you might see on a terminal in the 1970s. Hi there, PG. So um, to kind of set the background for what we're gonna accomplish today, let's suppose that uh, you were like a banking professional in the 1970s. And what's, what's the big disruptive technology for banks in the, in the early 1970s, probably late 60s, 1970s? It's the computer, the so-called computer. Um, like, like before this time, can you imagine running a bank like just with paper and pencil and like no computers involved? That's the way we used to do it, apparently. And like, what's the, what's like, what's the biggest challenge in a bank? Comp computationally, like what's the biggest challenge computationally in a bank kind of prior to computers? Like we do things now that we never would have dreamed doing because they're so computationally intensive. But like, what was your biggest computing need? Okay, so, so keeping records is like, this is not, actually keeping records isn't so tough. Someone deposits some money, we write down they deposit it. Someone checks out some money, they, or checks out, you don't check out money, you're not gonna return it. You withdraw money and uh, you withdraw it. So all these transactions, recording transactions, that's not too bad. But there's, there is something that comes along with banking that is a computational nightmare without computing power. Yeah, it's calculating interest. In fact, it used to be that you'd like you'd show once a quarter you'd show up to go to the bank to um, like deposit, you know, maybe make a withdrawal at the bank, and there's a sign on the door that says we are closed today. Like the whole bank is closed. Why is it closed? Because every employee at that bank is compounding interest. Like we are working together 
to compound interest. And what we do is we, so we kind of go look at the balance and we say, what was the maximum, or it depends on if it's a loan or if it's, if it's a loan account, we would go on the minimum balance. Uh, we'd go on the maximum balance. If it was a, uh, an account where you're actually de a depositing account, we would, we would take the minimum balance during the quarter and we would accrue interest. We would say, okay, that was the minimum balance during this quarter. The interest rate for that account is, we would figure out, we would do the math. So we, like even like beforehand calculators, we'd do the math and we would make another entry that says this interest has accrued at this point. And so like the promise of like these computers to be able to, for nothing else, to be able to accrue interest has got banks going, this would be so much better if we didn't have to close the bank and everyone work on this once a quarter to do. Uh, and so, so we're now thinking, all right, you know, we, 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 here we are, we're designing our new banking system. There's, in, in your screen looks like, just like the black part of the screen. There's no, uh, there's no color. Well, there's green and black, that's it. That's your only choice. There's no mouse, like just a keyboard. And now we're gonna we're we are going to design the simplest interface possible, a cash deposit. So we're gonna together right now. We're gonna design the screen. What do we need to be able to make a cash deposit? So help me out here. You're, you're starting with a blank black screen. How are we gonna design this interface to be able to do a cash deposit? What information do we need to be able to do a cash deposit? Now, as you're thinking about this. To realize there's some constraints in the world of computing in the 1970s that we don't have today. One of them is that like network, like making a request across a network is really expensive, both in terms of how long it takes and like literally what it costs to do, like to be able to maintain a network, it's expensive. The second, and so we wanna, we wanna avoid that as much as possible. The second thing we wanna avoid as much as possible is writing to disk, also expensive. It takes a long time. Reading from a disk, writing, from, writing to disk, Expensive, we want to avoid it whenever we can. By the way, in 1970, in 1970, there's something you could buy, in the world of computing, there's something you could buy in 1970 that cost $1 million, that today cost two cents. You know what that is? A gigabyte of storage. A gigabyte of hard disk storage in 1970 cost a million dollars, and today it's two cents, that's amazing. So it's a different world in computing. So we got some constraints here, okay. So now those two big constraints, it's expensive to, to talk across a network, it's expensive to write, to write or read from a hard disk. What do we got it? So what do we need to do? Help me out, cash deposit. We're just, this is just the screen. Someone comes in and says, I wanna make a cash deposit. The teller has pressed F7 and up comes the cash deposit screen. What's it gonna look like? Go ahead. Ah, okay, so we're gonna go with the, we'll call it the account ID. Okay, so account, account, uh, A-C-C-O-U-N-T, ID. And you know what, we, we actually have a little more flexibility because we can either have black on green or we can have green on black. And that's like our two choices here. So let's go ahead and make this kind of look like a field and we'll make the text there to be black. So we have an account ID here and the teller would type in, it would say account ID and you could type in the account number. Okay, great. What else do we need? We're close. I mean, it's a simple transaction. We are close to being done. What else do we need? We yeah, we need the amount. We got the account, we got the amount, and that's it. Oh. That would be a deposit. Oops. Bring those a little closer together because we don't have that much screen space. Ah, and there's no button because there's no click to click on. And so you're going to type that in. You'll press enter or something when you're done. I'm not sure what you'll press, but that sounds pretty good. Now, what, what's the risk? What is the problem with this? What's the, what's the danger? Um, what's going, what could possibly go wrong with this screen? And we want to do what we can do to kind of Make sure we don't have ter we don't have terrible things happen. Okay. Ah, this is a problem. This would be a big problem. Wrong. Someone types in the wrong account number, because you know after all, typing in it's it's new for us because computers are pretty new. So typing in that number is going to be difficult. So here's what I'd like to do. 
uh, we want to be able to validate both the amount and uh, a number. Now, um, the, like the amount, pretty good because you got the person there. You know, we're going to print off a little receipt and give it to them, and it's going to have the amount on it, and they can check it. They can validate that. But the problem is most folks don't know their account number. Like they can't look at the account number and validate it. So what are we going to do to make sure that the teller typed the account number in correctly? This is our task for the moment. How are we going to make sure that there's not a typo in the account number? What are your ideas? I know you weren't even born in the 1970s. I was barely born in the 1970s. So you probably don't, you can't like remember back to what the world is like. So just give it your best guess. Go ahead. I have to type it in twice. Okay, so that's a possibility. So um, you could have like, you have to actually enter the, the account ID twice. So that's pretty good. So tell me, tell me, and in fact, what we like about that is if it's just like an errant keystroke, then, then they're going to correct it. If the two don't match, then we can immediately say, hey, there's a problem here. So I like this because this solution does not require hard disk access or network access. Um, so I like it. What, what, what is there to dislike about this approach? Ah, so what if the problem is not an output problem from the brain to the fingers? What if it's an input problem from whatever you're reading you know, to your brain? So that, uh, that is a problem because then the output would be the same. So yeah, so that's, it's going to miss that. And it's a lot of extra typing. It's not a terrible amount of extra typing. It's not, it's not so much that would go, oh, that's too much typing. But, so it's pretty good. But yeah, it's going to kind of catch half of the problem. If it's an output problem, we'll catch it, but we won't catch it as an input problem. Okay, so any other thoughts? You know, if we can't come up with anything else, then we'll, we'll have to go with that. What else you got? Ah, oh, okay. So yeah, you know, this, we, we know what the valid count ID is. Did you even type in a, a real account ID? And this is going to require either hard disk access or it's going to require network access. And so we look at that and we say, too expensive. So we're, we're better off with just having them type it in twice and, and go in there. And it's because it, it'll take too long. Like, it'll just extend the, how long it takes to do the transaction. So that's, that's a solution that we might do in the 80s, but in the 70s, we're not there yet. Other thoughts? I'm going to I'm going to tell you what the solution they came up with in the 1970s. They said what we're going to do is we, somebody some bright person came up with the idea of a check of a called a check sum. Have you heard of it? Check sum, have you heard of it? We use it in kind of a different context today. Uh, like in uh, security and encryption. But here's the idea. So listen, our account numbers are five digits. Our, our bank account numbers are five digits. So what we're going to do is we're going to literally, here's the account number. It's, it's the 25,658th account number that was ever created. The next one that's created is going to be 25,659. But what we're going to do is we're going to say this. We are going to sum up the digits. Two, there's 10, there's eight. That is 26. That sum of those digits is 26. And so we're going to say our account number is not five digits. Our account number is seven digits. And we're going to put those last two digits are going to be the sum of the five digits that come before it. Now, when someone types in the account number, they type in seven digits. And what can we do? Without accessing a hard disk or going across a network to validate that they've typed it incorrectly, that they've typed it, that they have correctly typed in the number. Yeah, take the first five digits, add them up, and see if that's the same as the last two digits. If it is, it's a well-formed account number. That's delightful. So, so I get like I get better than having them type it twice because now if the error was reading it in, they type the same number twice. I mean, whether they've whether they've read it wrong or typed it wrong, this is still going to catch the problem. But what's the deficiency with this approach? What's the most common typographical error that this would not protect us against? Go ahead. Yeah, two digit, two sequential digits transposed. That is the most common uh, typographical error. Two uh, sequential digits transposed. Um, well, maybe a single digit out of place. A single digit out of place, we catch. Two sequential, two any two digits transposed, we don't get because it's just you have the right digits here. 
And so pretty quickly after the check sum, they came up with the idea of, of a thing called a check digit. A check digit says, you know what? Well, first of all, it's going to be a digit instead of a sum. And so instead of um, two, I'm sorry, it's going to be a check digit instead of two digits. And so we're going to do this with just a single digit. But what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit more complex math. So instead of just summing them up, we might take the first number and uh, multiply it by one, take the second number and multiply it by two, third number, multiply it by three, and then uh, take the, um, the remain whatever number that comes up to, we'll divide that by uh, 10 and take the remainder. And that will be the, the check digit. So a little bit more complex, but if we can come up with a good check digit algorithm, then the, here's the two characteristics. Number one, it'll protect against any single digit being wrong. Number two, it will produce just an one extra digit that we have to type to be able to do the validation. And number three, it'll protect against any two sequential digits transposed. Uh, and so like virtually any time you've got a, 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 a number that gets typed in today, like an identifying number that gets typed in, there is some kind of check digit built into that. Have you ever noticed like uh, when you're entering a credit card number on a website, and like you've typed your credit card number in and they like the immediately, you put in that 16th digit and they immediately go, that's not a valid, sorry, check your number. Just, have you ever noticed that? You typed in the number and like immediately know and you go, how do they know that so fast? Did they look it up? No, they didn't look it up because there's a check digit built into credit card numbers. You can look at the credit card numbers, you can apply some mathematical algorithm to it and you can know instantly, is it a well-formed number or not a well-formed number? We don't know if the number is valid, we don't know if it belongs to you, but we can at least tell you it's not really a credit card number. Um, and so that's the idea. And our goal then today is to implement, to write a function that can validate uh, an ISBN. So international standard book number, that number that's on the back of your textbook, that will type that in and we'll make sure that it's a well-formed number. So that's where we're headed today. But while we're here in the space of uh, of our kind of 1970s, 1980s banking application. Uh, okay. Reminds me of my former colleague, who now I'm not sure he was ever my colleague uh, anymore, Frank Abagnale Jr. Have you heard of him? Who says, yeah, Frank Abagnale Jr., who, who in the book, Catch Me If You Can, which was as a biography. It wasn't an autobiography, I don't think. It was his biography. Um, in that, he claims to have actually, uh, you know, he's a pretty famous fraudster. Uh, he claims to have gotten a job teaching psychology at Brigham Young University, you know, when he was here for a few semesters. Uh, doing a little more research on it today before class, sounds like KS in 2006, KSL may have actually proved that this was not quite the truth. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that was what he claimed. So this actually kind of gets down, it's just interesting, but it gets down to his very first financial instrument fraud. Um, uh, and it was this, he noticed that like in the bank, when people came in to make a deposit, like if you had your checkbook, how many of you have a checkbook? Actually, how many of you don't have a checkbook? Yeah, okay, that's most of you. So uh, back in the days when you had checkbooks, like in the back of your checkbook, when you had checks printed, there was also deposit slips printed that had your check number, had your account number on it. And you would kind of fill out your checks that you're depositing and how much cash and you'd give it to the teller and they would kind of look over it and then do the deposit. I actually filled out a deposit slip like for a bank not long ago. And I like, I barely, my wife does all of our transactions. I had to deposit something, fill out a deposit slip. Took it to the teller and the teller's like, don't even need that. And then just, you know, entered the information from the deposit straight from the checks. But he noticed that if you didn't have a pre-printed deposit slip, well, the bank has just blank deposit slips like sitting there in the counter, a whole stack of them. You would go and you would pull one out um, and you would, you know, put it the information about your, amount. If you had your account number, you'd write the account number in. But if you didn't, and you took it to the teller, the teller would like, oh, hey, we've got to look up your account number. Tell me your name and whatever. They look up the account number. But if the account number is filled in, the teller just types it in. Well, he realized that he could take that, he, like he took a stack of those blank deposit slips out of the bank, walked them home to his apartment, rolled them into a typewriter, and he typed his account number onto those slips. And he took those slips and he put them back in the, at the bank. So when Edna comes and deposits her Social Security check, she does the same way she's always done it. She takes the counter slip up. She leaves the, doesn't write anything in the account number because she doesn't know her account number. She puts in the information about the check. She takes it up. The teller sees it. Oh, type in the account number right here, types it in, deposits the check. Everyone's happy. 
especially Frank, two weeks later, when he withdraws the money and closes the account. Uh, that was his very first financial instrument fraud. Uh, they got more sophisticated, um, as you might imagine. Um, like, like, what was his like real main contribution to financial instrument fraud? He's like the one that figured out, you know what? If you printed a check, like you actually went to the expense to print a check, if you could get the account information, you could print a check and you put like routing numbers on the bottom. Like those numbers on the bottom of a the check, they tell you kind of which part of the country to send that check. You put a routing number in there that sent it to the East Coast for a bank that was drawn against the West Coast, it would take a month for that check to clear. I mean, now when a check clears, like you know, like the funds have actually been transferred. But then how did you know a check bounced? Like in the 1980s, 1990s, how would you know that a check bounced? I, I'm sorry, you know it, you know it bounced because the check actually, the physical check went from your bank to some other bank to say, hey, transfer this money. And they said, there's not enough money. They stamped NSF, non-sufficient funds, and they sent the check back to you. So you would know that a check cleared because it didn't bounce. And it takes about a week to bounce. And, but he made it, no, he could make it take a month to bounce. And so you could come in, deposit a bunch of checks that were all fake. They would get cleared, their funds would get released. He'd spend the money, close the account before the check ever bounced. Amazing. Anyway, he now works for the FBI, um, catching people that do innovative things with financial instrument fraud. You know, he knows what he's doing. He's like the expert. That's after spending quite a bit of time in prison. Okay. Uh, but let's take a look then at the algorithm that uh, we're going to do for uh, the check digit. So I'm going to follow the ISBN page at Wikipedia. And here is the 10 digit uh, calculation. Now, so our next project is going to be um, implementing the 13 digit ISBN validator. So today in class, we are going to implement a 10 digit ISBN. When check digits, or I'm sorry, when ISBNs were first invented, they had 10 digits. And they were invented in the 1970s. Like they in, in like check digits. I mean, ISBNs have been around longer than barcodes have been. Then we get to like the 1990s, nearly 2000s, and it's like everything's got a, every product's got a number, not just books. And we've now got a barcode. And they said, you know what? It would be better if like ISBNs were like kind of the same pattern as every other product number. So they said, okay, we'll make a 13 digit ISBN. And the, the first 13, the first three characters just say, this is a book. And the next 10 digits say, this is the book that it is. So if you have an older ISBN, it's got 10 digits, you know, kind of prior to 2007, it's got 10 digits. And we're going to implement in class the algorithm to validate that. Your project was going to be to validate a 13 digit. ISBN. So what we're doing in class today is going to be really similar to what you'll need to do for the project. Here is the, here is the, um, like how you calculate the check digit. We're doing the examples. Here's a Wikipedia page. Here's how you, how you calculate the check digit for an ISBN, a 10 digit ISBN. Um, you take this ISBN that is, um, you know, zero, three, six, four, whatever that number is right there. And the question mark is we're trying to figure out what the check digit should be. Like the ISBN actually has a character there. And so whether we're you know, figuring out what the character is going to be or we're validating it, we take the first nine digits, we put it through an algorithm and see if it equals the last digit. So uh, here it is. You take the first character, the six, the zero here, and you multiply it by 10. You take the second character, the three, you multiply it by nine. The next character, you multiply it by eight. Next by seven, by six. By, so you multiply all those, you add them up. You get a number for that. Then you take that number, and it's kind of tough to see here. Do they do it, explain it better up here? Okay, here's where they talk about it. Here's the, here is the, like, like the graphic for this. So we're taking these digits. We're multiplying the first one by 10, next one by 9, all the way down to multiplying it by 2. We add those up. So that gives us 236. So that's the, that's the math here. We then take 236 and we divide it by 11 and take the remainder. Mod, it stands for modulus. You remember doing long division in the fourth grade. You got a remainder in your long division problem. That is what, that's the operation for mod. So mod says we don't care about like the quotient, we just care about the remainder. So if I take 236, divide it by 11, the remainder is five. That's what I'm after here. I then take 11 and I subtract five from it, that gives me six. 
I then take six mod 11, that also gives me six, and then that's my check digit. Unless, like what's the possible values I could get as a remainder when I divide something by 11? Obviously I can get a six, we see it in the example. What are my other possibilities? Yeah, zero through 10. If I get a remainder of 11, there's a problem. I did the division wrong. It means, you know, the quotient should be one bigger. Uh, and so zero through 10. And the whole idea of a check digit is that it is a single digit. So if we're, if we're taking this mod 11, how do we get to a single digit? Because a possibility of the result is 10. Is there any way to show the value 10, the number 10 as a single digit? How do you do it? Roman numerals. Yeah, Roman numeral X is 10. So like literally, if you look at a 10 digit ISBN, approximately one out of every 10, the check digit will be X. And the X in that number means 10. It's a little bit uncomfortable because you got to reach over and type it on the keyboard instead of the 10 keypad. Um, anyone ever like work at a bookstore? Anyone here? Yeah. Did, did, did they have like on the cash register? Um, well, you may not have known this, but you tell me if, you, if this is familiar with your experience. Like they actually have um, special keyboards that have an X on it. If you have to type in ISBNs a lot because they put an X over there on the keyboard so you don't have to go over the rest of the board. Did they have the X key on the 10 keypad? 11 keypad, excellent, yeah. So um, he's probably just saying that, you know, so it'll look like what I'm talking about. So thank you, you'll get your extra credit points tomorrow. <clears throat> um, so it might, it might be an X, but that's how we can, so, that's, so that's, the, that's the algorithm. So this is the algorithm that we're about to implement. Are you ready to do it? Let's do it. Yeah. So why did they choose 11 instead of like a one digit number so you wouldn't have to worry about X? Okay, the question is, why didn't they do this better? And the answer is, it was the 1970s. We weren't very good at this. Um, we're balancing off how complex the calculation is with the desirability of getting down to a single digit. And apparently they just thought, best we can do. Yeah. Um, good news. So, so we have to specifically think about X here. Uh, the good news for you is that the 13 digit algorithm is mod is involved, which is almost always involved for check digits. And it is uh, 10, it's mod 10. So you don't have to deal with X for the homework. You'll be dealing just with digits. Yay. All right. So open up. Oh, and let's see. So I'm going to open up uh, Excel. Wow, I got nothing going on here. Let me view. I'm opening up my um, code window. View my project explorer. Here we go. And I'm going to insert a module. Okay, so we're making a function procedure. Anytime I'm writing a block of code in VBA, well, almost every time, it's going to be a procedure. Either the two main categories of procedures are sub-procedures, which we've done all the time since we started class. Starts with the keyword sub. Function procedure starts with the keyword function. So we type in function, and then we give it the name. Just like we give a sub-procedure name, we give the function procedure name. I'm going to call it is valid ISBN 10. That's a great function name. Now, inside the parentheses, I'm going, to, I'm going to take in a candidate as a string. So remember, inside these parentheses, all I can do is declare a variable. I don't use the keyword dim, but I declare a variable, a candidate as a string. And then functions also have a return type. What data type will they send back? Now, I, all I want this function to do is, is return, I just want to know, is it valid or not? You're going to give me an ISBN. I'm going to say, is it well-formed? So what's a good data type to use as the return value? Yeah, probably the best bet is Boolean, just a true or false value. So Boolean and, oops, and then I'm ready. Uh, oh, sorry, as Boolean. So now I've set my function up. It's called I, it is valid ISBN 10. It's going to take in some string of characters that I'm going to then validate. And then it's going to return a true or false. Okay, so I'm going to come in here. In fact, at this point, I can actually I can actually use this. Let's take the example from the Wikipedia page and check digit calculation. Looks like it's two. So this is the example I'm going to use. And you can just type this in. It's not it's only like 10 digits, so you should be able to type it in without too much trouble. And I'm going to come here and I guess I'm going to make a new sheet still. Just put it here like in C2, 
here is my ISBN, and it's like dash two is a check digit for this one. So I've got an ISBN here, and now that I've created my function is valid ISBN 13, I can come right here into the cell and put equals is valid ISBN 13. Wow, Excel even knows that it's there. It's like, oh, you could just do this one. Yeah, that's the one I want. I'm gonna tell it to take in this value and it's gonna return true or false. Holy cow, it's not valid. Why is it not valid? I, I never told it to do anything. I've gotta actually do some, I can't just hope that it does it right, right? I've gotta put something in there, but because it's a Boolean type, it's gonna return false unless I tell it otherwise. That's a default value for the Boolean. So how do I set the, how do I actually tell it what to return? It's kind of weird, but in this language, by setting the name of the function equal to something, it will change. That, that's how I set the value that it returns. So now instead of always returning false, it'll always return true, regardless of what I send into it, because I haven't done the math yet. So now if I come back here and do something that causes us to refresh, like edit this cell and then hit enter on it again, it'll cause that function to recalculate. And now it comes back with a new value of true. So, so step one is um, you know, figure out how to get that thing to return a value And, and, and we set that right here. But we've got a lot of work to do uh, in the meantime. So the first thing to realize is that the, the check digit calculations, they don't, take, they don't take into consideration any of these dashes or spaces. And, and you will see ISBNs written in these different groups because the different segments mean something. So just like when we were talking about a VIN, like the first three digits tell me something about who the manufacturer is and where it was manufactured. The WMI, the World Manufacturing Index. Like, I don't know what they are. It probably talks about it on this page. Like that 306 probably identifies the publisher. Um, I don't know what the first one identifies. You could read the page, I'm sure it would tell you. So they have these different segments because those different parts of it are meaningful. But in the calculation, it's just, we just need the set of digits. And so you'll see them written either with dashes in the ISBN, spaces, sometimes slashes, sometimes periods, like anything that's not a number is just like used to separate that. So I think the first thing that I want to do is I want to start off by saying, let me just take whatever is sent in here and get it down just to the digits. So in fact, I think I'm going to want to make another, I'm probably going to want to make another function for that. So we've just got this one started. And I'm going to build another function. In fact, I'm going to call this function valid characters. So let me come in here and say, I'm bringing this candidate and I'll just, maybe I'll just call it the ISBN. So let me dim, dim ISBN as, a, what type should we make the ISBN? So in other words, after we've taken and gotten rid of all the non-numeric characters, what data type should we use? Okay, so integer is a possibility, but integer won't work. And why won't integer work? Yeah, range is only 32,000. So like, like the biggest, the most number of digits I can do is only five digits. This has to be 10 digits. And what? Ah, it has an X. So no, it doesn't matter how big the number I make, it's not gonna work because the ISBN itself could have an X. So what should I do? String. And then let's just say that my ISBN is going to equal the results of a function I have not yet written called valid characters. Uh, and then I'm going to pass the candidate to valid characters. So I've got to go write the function called valid characters. It's going to take in something and it's going to only send back the characters that could possibly be the ISBN that we're trying to identify. So let's go ahead and write that one. We'll just write that one here right below. So function, valid, valid characters. I'm just going to take it in. So even though it's called candidate up here, I can call the variable that I declare down here. I can call it anything. I'll just call it data. I'll take that in as a string. And because I might be returning an X here, it's going to return a string. Okay, so now I've got to look at all these characters. And whew, I want to throw away anything that's not a number or an X. Whew. Hmm. Well, what if I have an X kind of in the middle? 
I think for simplicity, I'm going to say, you know what, if it's a number or an X, send it back. Hmm. Let's at least get to that point and decide if we want to do something different. Okay, so I'm going to use the same example here. So let me go get that off of my sheet. But I'm going to do this kind of over here in the immediate window. So let me just print the results kind of while I'm working on this. I need some way to be able to run this. So here in the immediate window, I'll say valid characters. I'm sending it in this string. Oh, by the way, what happens if I forget to put quotes around this? Tell me what's going to happen. Is this going to give me an error? This won't give me an error, and why not? I'm just going to, I'm just going to print that number. I'm going to print this without putting it. Let me go ahead and first print it as a string. No surprise. But what if I forget to put the quotes on? This is going to be mind-blowing. Whoa. Negative 40,923. Why? Yeah, it's like 0 minus 306 minus 40,615 minus 2 is that. I, it, it recognized that as a valid expression. So I definitely have to make sure I put the quotes around it. Every once in a while, I'll have a student, you know, get on for help. Can't figure out why it's not working. Just you didn't put quotes around what you're sending in, so it comes in with a different number. Okay, so now I'm calling valid characters. I'm giving it this string of characters. It's going to be called data in here. So at this point, let me just return exactly what was passed in. So valid characters equals data. This is going to be really boring. It's just going to return whatever we send in. Uh, I think valid character. Oh, no, it's return data, not valid characters. Valid characters equals data. And so it just sends back whatever we sent in. But now we've got to do a little bit of math on it to figure out what's, well, not math. We've got to throw away anything that's not valid. Okay, we did something like this. Like we did not, a couple of days ago, a couple of meetings ago, we, we made something called numbers only. And it went something like this. We declared uh, X as an integer because we're going to make a loop. Uh, we declared temp as a string, and then we said 4x. So this is so far, I'm going kind of fast here because this is stuff we've seen before. But feel free to ask a question if you want to. 4x equals 1 to the length of the data that was passed in. And we're just going to say if, I'll, I'll just do the, I'll do the part that we did for the numbers as well. If is numeric. Oh, actually, I did one more thing. Let's declare one more variable here called one char character as a string. If, uh, let's establish one char. We want to look at one character in the string at a time. Each time we go through the loop, we want to look at a different character. So one character is equal to the mid of the data that we passed in, starting at the X position and taking one character. So as this loop goes through, the first time X will be one, this will be say, I want, the, I want to take a substring, a string out of the middle of this string. Start at whatever data was passed in. Look at the number one character the first time through. It's going to be a one. Take one character. That'll be the first character. Next time through the loop, X will be two. It will look at the second. Start at the second character and take one character. It'll be the second character. Third character, fourth character, fifth character. So if one character is numeric. So is, nu is numeric. This numeric function just looks at a string and says, if that's actually a string representation of a number, return true, otherwise return false. So if it's a number, we're going to do something. What are we going to do? We're just going to start to accumulate those digits. So we'll say our temp variable is equal to what it used to be concatenated with that one character. And now we'll return temp instead of data. Show me how comfortable you are with the loop. That's what we've shown here, zero to five. Five, 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 five. Looks like most folks who are voting are pretty comfortable with it. Okay. So now what I'm expecting to get is everything but those hyphens because every other digit in this is um, numeric. But if we put an X for the check digit instead of a two, we're missing the X because the X isn't numeric. So here, I think what we want to do is let's just let's just put an, an or clause in here. We're going to keep that if it's numeric, or 
one char is equal to x. Trouble is, if they type an uppercase, they might type an uppercase or lowercase. So let's let's take the lowercase of that character. So if the lowercase version L case is equal to X, then we'll add it on. And then let's just to, so that we don't have to worry about it being uppercase or lowercase, let's have this come back as lowercase. So let me low, let me L case the one char as well. Turns out if you lowercase a number, it's still just the same number. So I'll lowercase that number as well. So now that should bring back the X. Oh, we could stop there. But another possibility would be to say, you know what? We could throw this X out as well. What do you want to do? Should we leave that X in or should we throw it out? Let's leave it in for now. And if we end up having time at the end, maybe we'll come back and throw it out. And for now, we'll just assume that we don't end up with an X in the middle because having an X in the middle could really throw an X into the works, a wrench into the works. It'd be nice if we could assume everything besides the check digit was numeric. Let's make that assumption for now. And if we have time, we'll come back and actually make the valid characters throw away an X that's not on the end. So, Paul, those ones that tell you equal X in all the statements, is that supposed to be a assignment of those these X? Or are we just saying if this is, yeah, this is not assignment. This is comparison. And it's one of the things that's kind of interesting about VBA is that it uses the same symbol for assignment as it does for logical comparison. So here's an assignment. Here's logical comparison. Most languages use a different symbol. One really common thing for like Python is a double equal sign. In JavaScript, it's like the triple equal sign. In, um, in um, Pascal, it's a single equal sign, but assignment is colon equals instead of equals. But in VBA, it's like, you know what? Just we we'll use the same symbol and, and it'll figure out from the context whether you mean assignment or whether you mean comparison. All right, so for now, we're gonna ignore the possibility of an X being in the middle, but whether we've got like spaces or anything else that's non-numeric, we could use some dashes, digits, a slash in there, and that should come back with just Numeric digits or an X will be the only thing that it brings back. Okay, so now my ISVN, let me just go ahead and I'm gonna run this, but I'll put a stop in here and kind of run up to that point. And so the point is my ISVN now should be just the valid characters. Because I've, I've said, hey, step one, Take whatever the user passed in and let's filter it through the valid characters function and we'll accept that back as a thing we're going to work with. Okay, at this point, we can do a quick check and know, you know what, this thing is, there's no way this is a valid 10 digit ISBN. We're done. What can we do? What can we look at now and say, poof, this thing's not, this thing's not valid. Get me out of here. Yeah. At this point, we've gotten rid of anything that's not part of the digits. And so at this point, if it's not 10 digits, it's, it can't possibly, I don't have to do any more math. If it's not the right length, it's not possibly a 10 digit, a valid 10 digit ISBN. So let's do this. I'm gonna say if the length of my ISBN hmm, is not equal to, and here's one way to write not equal to, less than, greater than. 10, then exit function. You're, we're done. By the way, what value will this function return if I end, if I, if I get out of the function with this exit function? Yeah, because it's a Boolean type, it will return the default value for Boolean unless I change it. And so if I exit without ever making it true, it will return false. So this is if 
we don't have 10 digits, return false. Now we're ready to implement the algorithm. And that algorithm says, we're gonna take the first digit, multiply it by 10. Second digit, multiply it by nine. Third digit, multiply it by eight. I'm gonna need some way to kind of keep track of that value as I'm doing the multiplication and then kind of adding it up. And so let me go ahead and create another variable here called my check sum. So dim check sum as an integer. The biggest it could be is 10 times nine plus, even if it's 10 times nine, 10 times, I'm not gonna outrun what an integer can do. So I'll use integer as the check sum. And let me also declare a variable to control a for loop, dim x as an integer. Okay, so let me go across those. In fact, before I write the loop, let me just, and, and here when we're implementing a loop, sometimes it's helpful to think about writing several of the, of the lines, not with a loop at all, but just kind of write them out by hand. And then we can kind of see the patterns and it helps us to be able to make the loop. So let's just do this. I'm gonna to start to do this math kind of by hand. So let's say my checksum is going to equal, I'll start it off by saying it's gonna equal the first part of my thing. So what I need is the left one character of my ISBN. But that's gonna give me the zero. And I'm gonna multiply that by 10. Is that what I'm supposed to do? Yeah, I take that first one, multiply by 10, second one gets multiplied by nine, by eight, okay. Uh, and I'm going to take that digit and I'm going to multiply it by 10. Okay, now after that, I've got to now, that's going to give me the first part of this problem. I then have to add that to the second digit multiplied by 9. So I'm going to say check sum equals what it used to be. Plus, now what I need is the mid of ISBN. Starting at the second character, taking one character. That will give me the that will give me the, the three and multiply that by nine. I'm gonna do two more so I can kind of see the pattern. I'm then gonna say, I want the third character, multiply it by eight. I want the fourth character multiplied by seven. So it looks like my very first one is different, but the rest of them are gonna follow this same pattern. And I can see that these two lines of code are identical except for that number changes and this number changes. And I wonder, could I reformulate this line so that it follows the pattern of the others? And the answer is, yeah, I could at least do the mid. I can, instead of doing left, I could say, well, I can, I can do the same thing with mid here, starting at one and taking one. So now my starting value is gonna be, kind of follows the same pattern, right? If I space that over, you can see it's, it's kind of the same thing, right? So this is, oh, not plus, this is 10 times. That's the other benefit that you see in the pattern is that I can see the typo. The same pattern, 10, 9, 8, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4. But what if I brought the checksum in as well? What would this mean? What data type is checksum? It's an integer and all numeric values are initialized to the same value. What's the value? Zero. So this actually does the same thing. I'm saying the new value for checksum is the old value, zero plus this. 
So it's actually, even though we wrote it first, it looked quite a bit different. It's really the same pattern here. So now I should be able to put this into a loop and I can see exactly what's gonna be the same and what's gonna have to change. So I either have to go from one to, from one, two, three, four, eight. I think I'm gonna do this with nine digits. Yeah, because I'm not doing the check digit. I did the check digit's not involved. So I either have to go from one to nine, or I need a variable that goes from one to nine or that goes from 10 to two. And either one would be fine. One to nine seems a little bit nicer. So I think I'm just gonna say four X equals one to nine. Maybe I'll leave those same ones there at the bottom and let me bring one copy of it in that I'll modify. Now, the one to nine is in this position right here. It's this one right here. So I'm just gonna change that to X. But now how can I get my 10, 9, 8, 7? How can I get that to come in here as an expression based on X? What would that expression be? So I have X that goes one, two, three, four, five. And over here, I need 10, 9, 8, 7. So yeah, just subtract X, but not subtracting it from 10, subtracting it from 11. Yeah, so we take 11 minus one, that gives me 10. 11 minus two gives me nine, 11 minus three. So I'm doing multiplication in there. I'll put this in parentheses here because I don't want the multiplication to kind of outstrip my other one here. I'm just gonna say X minus, I'm sorry, 11 minus X. And that will give me then that same set that we did by hand here but now just with a loop. Oh, that's delightful. I'm gonna stop this and I'll just come up to my immediate window and hit enter on the line that's running the function again. I've got now to stop. Let me see what checksum is. It's 130. Oh, that sounds familiar. Like that's the example. Yeah, it's done. It tells me that's 130. Here on Wikipedia, it's gotta be true. Wikipedia said it, so it's gotta be true. So 130 is the, some of that vector of numbers. So we've we've done that correctly. Delightful. Whew. So what's our next step? So our next step is take the sum of that, take it mod 11. And the truth is I'm done with the 130. So my next step here, I'm just going to say, after I've done that part, I'm going to put a new value in checksum. Checksum equals its current value, mod 11. I'll just drag my insertion point back to there and run it. And now let's see what checksum is. Checksum is nine. You go to the example. Yeah, that 130 mod 11 translates into nine down here. Well, the next step looks like I take 11 minus nine. Is that what it said over here? Yeah, the next one is 11 minus the result of that. I think that's set up that I could actually plug these numbers in. I am gonna, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna take this ISBN. I'm gonna plug it onto this. I think that will calculate. It doesn't calculate, Never mind. I'm not gonna do it. Okay. So I've got the nine. And my next step is to take that, uh, the result from that step, take 11 minus that number. So that's my next step. The next version of checksum. Equals 11 minus checksum. I'll run that line. And that now gives me two. There's the 11, there's the 11 minus that nine gives me the two. I then take that mod 11. So one more step to go. It's actually the same as this one. I'm just gonna run this line again.
And that's still going to give me two. And that is the check digit in this case. But I have the one other thing, and that is if the, at this point, if my check sum is 10, then that's going to be a special case. So we could change the check sum to X. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's just put an if statement. If, oh, no, we can't because check sum is, we've set check sum up as an integer. So we can't just make it into X. So let's, we'll, we'll treat that as a special case. So now we're going to say if, in fact, let's handle the special case first. If the check sum is equal to 10 and like the rightmost character of my ISBN is X, then that's a valid, that's valid. And the right of ISBN comma one is equal to, it'll be lowercase because we only get back lowercase X's then what are we going to do? Return true. We know it's the right, oh, I'm sorry, not return, sorry, wrong language. Name of the function equals true. We made it all the way down through here and we've said our, the check sum we calculated was 10 and the check digit is X. Uh, that's right. That's that's true. Now, if that's not the case, else if the check sum is equal to the rightmost character. In that case, we return true. In any other case, we return false. And we don't really have to put this one because if we don't return anything, if we don't tell it what to return, it will return false. I kind of like to have it here so I can see this. I can say, listen, it's based on this if statement. I know what I'm going to return. It's going to be true, true, or false, depending on the conditions here. And I'll get rid of this. There's no way to reach this now because I will hit one of these three lines. So I'll get rid of that and get rid of my stop. Okay. So I think that, let me go ahead and change this X back for a two. This should give me true. And anything else I put in there for two should give me false. Should I keep checking? Even if I don't put it, it'll bring back false. If I don't put anything there, it brings back false because I've only got nine digits to work with. Question? I see a question in hand? No? Okay, so we're in pretty good shape. Like we've done the calculations here. The only thing we're going to die on is if someone has given us, like we could put like a bunch of A's in here. That won't matter because we're going to get, those are going to get filtered out. But if we've got an X here in the middle, that's going to be a problem. Hmm. It's not the problem I thought it would be. Let me kind of pause here and take a look at my at my uh, ISBN. Let me get right here. Let me put a stop in here and run that. Oh, it's because my length is wrong. Ah, it's because the X is the X is coming back in a digit, and I don't have ten digits. So let me change this opening X, this opening zero to an X. That should be the proper length now. And I think this is going to give me an error. Yeah, type mismatch. So if I look right down here at my, that's the first time through here, the mid of ISBN, this is bringing back that X. This is the first character. And I'm trying to take X and multiplying X by Oh, it's actually happening here. I'm trying to take the 11 minus X. This is the part that's failing. 11 minus, it's unfortunate the variable name is actually the contents of the variable as well at this point. 
um, probably should use a different character besides X. But it's trying to take 11 and minus the character X from it. It goes, you just can't do that. You can't take 11 and subtract X off of it. It's probably confusing enough. You, you can leave yours as X, but at least for demonstration purposes, let me change this. Let me change my, all my X's here to I. Okay, so in this point, it's failing here because we're trying to say what is 11 minus i? i is the name of the variable, and what is i holding at the moment? Oh, no, it's not that. 11 minus i is okay because i is just the number. That's 10. The problem is here. What is the mid of this? Like That's holding the character x. And so this evaluates to x, and I'm trying to multiply that by... 10, and it's saying 10 times the character X is meaningless. It doesn't know what to do with that, and that's why it's giving me the error. And the problem here arises because our valid characters is allowing that X to come back through, right? If we come here and look at what our ISBN is, that, because our valid character says, hey, if it's an X or a digit, send it back. So I think we're probably, to actually make this example work, we better say, the only place an X is allowed to be is on the very end. Oh, any thoughts on how we're going to do that down here? How are we going to say only if it's an X on the end is it allowed to be in? Yep. Okay, so the suggestion is he just, just run all the way through here, and then when it's done, check to see if the last character is an X. Now, if the last character is an X, that's okay. If the, last character is not a, if the last character is not an X, that's also okay. The problem is if there's an X anywhere else. So one approach might be to say, hey, take it this far and then loop through it again, but there's probably a simpler way. Yeah. Ah. So what you're saying is the only time that we're allowed to let this to say this x is valid to let this part in is if we're looking in a particular place and that particular place ah okay yeah okay so let's let's try it let's try let's see if we can come up with a condition that will do the trick for us so if the character is x and This is getting complex enough that I think I want to put this in as an else if. So if the, if the numeric, okay, if that's true, else if, our other condition here, don't need the parentheses and the or at this point, we'll do the same thing. And got some and here. So what is the and condition here? If it's an X and if the so if, if it's an X and the length of our temp is nine, that means we're getting ready to put on the tenth character. So if temp is nine digits already, we're about to put on the tenth digit, and that's an X, that would be an okay place to put it. So let's do that. I don't think that quite gets us there. And the length of temp is equal to nine. I think that's going to solve the problem that we observed up here. So I think this one is going to tell us this, that's now going to not fail. And I think it's going to tell us false. So the problem that we don't catch here is that if we have like a couple of other numbers on the end here, well, that'll still be false. Because it's gonna, that's gonna like, let's check and see what our, what our ISBN. Oh, actually, we'll just send that same expression down to see what it returns. 
So this is going to be valid characters. And let's go ahead and so it takes care of this problem. Let's put this back to a number. And where's our tenth digit? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it's that three is a tenth character. So let's put the X there. So that's going to come back. It's going to have put the X in the tenth character, and then it's going to put a three at the end. And that's going to that's going to fail because of the length. That's too long. So that will correctly reject that one as a valid number. I think I think that might be it. I think I think what we've done here actually does it. So now if we've got an X in the wrong place, it won't fail. This won't fail now. It'll still report that this is invalid. And that was the problem that we had before. So yeah, I think that so yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, and I think it's I thought it was gonna be more complex than this, but that's that's all it is. So we're gonna allow it. We're gonna allow it, we're gonna say hey, X is valid, like X is a valid character only on the condition where we've already accumulated nine characters. And then accept that as an X, otherwise X not allowed. Whew, boy, I wonder if I can find a list of ISBNs somewhere. Oh, we had them in a prior example. Which one was it? We had that list of ISBNs. We were doing some kind of text editing. Well, let's just see if I can find them. Uh, Harry Potter ISBNs. Harry Potter ISBN list. Hoping for one that I could copy a little more easily. Guide to Harry Potter books, no. No one just wants to give me a list of numbers. Well, oh. um, uh, books.xlsn is one of the ISBN open Oh, oh, you, uh, you're not telling me to Google it. You're telling me to go pick it up. Uh, I think those are the fifth of this month. This one down, uh, is what they're looking at. I think. Excellent. Enabled macros. There's, oh, darn it. There are 13 digit ISBNs. We need 10 digits. It would be hard to find anyway. Um, but here, let's just, we can take these. Here's a few. Back to my sheet. Sheet three. Plug these in and let's find. 989, nine. the number is the same. The check digit is different because it's calculated differently. It's gonna replace all of those with nothing. Uh, and now we'd have to like calculate what the check digit is. Be better if we found some 10 digit ones to calculate. We could calculate the check digit, put it in and then see that it works, but that wouldn't be a whole, that wouldn't be great because the same algorithm we're trying to check is what would be used to generate the numbers. 10 digit. Anatomy about what's the difference? Yeah, I guess you'll have to believe that it works. Can't even find a single example. Anyway, it works. So that is, uh, that's the process. The project then is gonna be exactly like what we did in class today, except 
1300 ISBN, so it's a different algorithm. So you'll have that and be off and running. Any questions? Let's call that good for today. Thanks for coming. Class dismissed.